break. That is the story we're going to look at this morning. That clip is from uh, the movie called The Nativity. Uh, it's, it was probably made about eight or nine years ago. It's one of the better ones. It still doesn't totally follow the biblical account. And uh, so it's not going to help you with the pop quiz that we're having this morning. Some of you who are college students know that this is exam season, so you just finished, so you might still be in them. So we're going to have a pop quiz class. So if you take out your program, your bulletin, uh, I think the questions will pop up here too. But I have to warn you, the movie might not have all the right answers. This one's pretty good. This movie is, is fairly accurate, but there are a few places where it doesn't follow the biblical text. So let's just go through the questions here. Number one, what does the wise men or magi refer to? <clears throat> and you have a couple options there. Men of educated class, eastern kings, astrologers, smart guys, traitors. <laughs> the answer, uh, I mean, several of these are, are kind of accurate, but astrologers, C. Okay, the term was given by Babylonians, Chaldeans, and Medes, and Persians, and others to teachers, priests, physicians, astrologers, seers, interpreters of dreams, augurs, soothsayers, sorcerers, etc. Some seriously seeking the truth, others were rogues and charlatan. And uh, so they were called magi or wise men. Uh, these were apparently astrologers, astronomers, maybe a little more of a scientific uh, role, uh, we saw his star in the east, the text says. So they were uh, astronomers. It was uh, kind of a fo a, an early form of analytics, ancient analytics, if you want to call it, what they were doing. Um, they would do dream analysis. Uh, at the time of Daniel, 600 years earlier, um, they would, they would listen to people's dreams and then record what happened afterwards. And they would do thousands and thousands of these, and then hopefully, because they thought there was a connection, and then if, if they could know your dream, then they could say, well, this is probably going to what's going to happen, because this is what happened to 300 other people in the past when they had that dream. So it was kind of an analytics. There was kind of a scientific component to it. But these guys obviously were astrologers, too. They were looking, uh, astronomers looking at the stars. Okay, the wise men stopped in Jerusalem to inform Herod about Jesus, to find out where Jesus was, to ask about the star they saw, for gas, to buy presents for Jesus. <laughs> Again, it may have been a couple of those, but it's B, to find out where Jesus was. Jerusalem was the capital city. It was the logical place to look for one born king of the Jews. Okay, number three, the wise men found Jesus in a manger, a stable, a house, a holiday inn, in a good mood. Okay, so this is where it gets a bit tricky. Um, actually, in a house, the text says. Okay. Uh, he was no longer in the stable. The text begins after Jesus was born. And when you come to verse 11, we'll read the text in just a minute. Jesus was in a house, no longer the stable, Jesus referred to, in the text, he's actually referred to as a child. Uh, the Greek work is paideon, uh, no longer a baby, brephos, an infant. He's no longer an infant. He's referred to as a child. So he might have been, you know, in the terrible twos, uh, the toddler stage uh, in Luke 2.12. Um, when the shepherds come, uh, that was at the manger. He's referred to as a brephos there, a baby in Luke. Camels couldn't fly. So if, if it's likely, you know, the, the, uh, God gives these astronomers the sign at Jesus' birth, and then they travel. It's a long journey. Uh, they're coming hundreds and hundreds of miles from Persia or whatever over to, to Jerusalem. What is frankincense? A precious metal, a precious fabric, a precious perfume, an eastern monster story? None of the above. Okay, it's a perfume. Frankincense was a perfume and also an incense, uh, beautiful smelling uh, incense. What is myrrh? An easily shaped metal, a spice used for burying people, a drink aftershave, 
none of the above. Well, it is B. It is a spice used for burying uh, people. Again, a very precious, valuable uh, spice, and it was used when people were buried. Obviously, they didn't have embalming, um, decomposing, get smelly, bad. So uh, you remember when Jesus is crucified, the ladies come. They, they, they want to put on spices and so forth on the body. And uh, so that was the custom of the day. And it was a spice that was used at burials. Bonus question, how many wise men came to see Jesus? We don't know. We don't know. We really don't know. The text doesn't tell us. Uh, why we usually think of three is because there are three gifts. So then we think, well, there must have been three people. Uh, but we don't know for sure. Uh, 16th century, they were actually given names. We don't know if these were their names. Gaspar, Melchior, and Belthazar were, were the names given to them. But uh, someday in heaven, we'll, we can uh, watch the full story, get the full story. So, uh, Matthew 2.1 is our text this morning. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you, you can use your uh, s- smart device, but we also have Bibles in the pew rack. It's page 956, 956 if you want to turn there. Let me actually uh, read the text now, and then uh, you'll see uh, exactly what the Bible, the details God chose, chose to, gave us, to give us about this historical event. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, we're going to Start by reading verses 1 to 8. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, uh, quoting here from the Old Testament, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you have found him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Okay, I, uh, I'm going to split up this text by looking at uh, two different responses. Actually, there were several uh, unique responses that were taking place in Jerusalem. The first place the wise men appear is in Jerusalem. And it's, it's interesting as you go through this narrative just to see the different responses. One of them obviously is anxiety. Uh, and we can relate to that today. We live in a very anxious world. It says uh, right at the beginning, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Uh, the coming of Jesus, Christmas time, who knew? Christmas time created anxiety. <laughs> Maybe some of you are feeling a little anxious with all that happens at Christmas time. But they were feeling anxious. They were disturbed. The, the, word, the Greek words means to agitate, to cause inward commotion, to take away calmness of mind, to disquiet, to make restless, to render anxious, to be distressed, to even strike one's spirit with fear and dread. They were anxious. Now, they had good reason to be anxious because there was another response. It's not specifically mentioned here, but it's, it's implied, and that was animosity or hostility. If the people were feeling anxious, Herod was was feeling a lot of hostility, okay? In the palace, there was a lot of hostility. Where is he born king of the Jews? Wait a minute, I'm king. Who does this guy think he's going to be? I'm the king. What's going to happen to me? For Herod, there was a lot more going on here. This represented a threat to his throne. Herod's ruthless hold on power uh, was well known. In fact, uh, uh, it was Augustus who who had this funny little quote, Caesar Augustus. So Caesar Augustus is Herod's boss. Herod's is an under ruler. Herod's given the area of Judea to rule. uh, But he used to say of Herod, better to be his sow than his son. Even in a place where, you know, pigs are a no-no in Israel. Um, 
you had a better chance of survival. He, um, in his lifetime, Herod killed two of his sons and one of his wives just because he felt threatened by them. He was a ruthless man. So he's not feeling uh, anxiety as much as, I mean, a bit of anxiety, but he's feeling a lot of hostility. And, and um, this makes the whole place nervous. Uh, when the elephants fight, the grass suffers, is the African proverb. And they're worried, wow, is there going to be a big political fight going on and then chaos in Jerusalem? So there's uh, anxiety, there's animosity, and then the other thing that struck me as I was reading through this text was the apathy of the priests. So they help Herod, they help Herod understand, they know the scriptures, they go back and they can tell him where the, the quote is, where the Messiah is supposed to come from, that he's supposed to come from Bethlehem. Uh, this is the line of David, the fulfilling prophecy that the Messiah would be from the royal line, he would be from the line of David, and David's house, his lineage was in Bethlehem, so they can give him that information. But don't you find it strange that they don't even seem interested beyond that? Why, why wouldn't they have, like, searched the wise men out and say, tell us more, we're interested, we've been looking for centuries, we're looking for the Messiah, has he come now, can we come with you, let's go, let's go to, I don't know of any of them even making the trip, it was five miles. It's almost like they didn't care. I don't know if they'd stopped believing the prophecies, or maybe they just liked status quo. We like the way things are right now. We're in charge. We're running things, and, and we're not sure we want it to be any different. They didn't seem to care. Had religion lulled them to sleep, anesthetized them to the real issues of sin and death and life and salvation? Did they like this religion that they could kind of control and manipulate and be in charge of? Had they lost the wonder and the worship of God? Had somewhere their hearts gone cold? So this is a question I'm going to keep asking uh, this morning, is where are you at with Jesus this morning? Does Jesus make you anxious? Hostile? I, I, I don't think anybody would be here this morning if they're hostile, but maybe you're here under duress. It's Christmas time, and the family said, we're going to church. You said, oh, okay, I'll go. I don't really want to go, but I'm... Or maybe just apathetic. Maybe apathetic. Jesus insists... Um, Jesus can be a little bit unsettling. I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's kind of like the C.S. Lewis, you know, line where Lucy asks, is it the lion, the lion, you know, representing Jesus in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that, that little uh, children's book, which, of course, is so much more. Um, she asked, is he safe? And he goes, a lion? No, he's not safe, but he's good. He's good. I have this illustration I like to use, and I, I like repeating it, and maybe some of you have seen it before, but it's like you're going along in life, and you're traveling along in life, and you decide that uh, it's not working. Um, and and uh, you've tried all kinds of things, but they're not, they're not satisfying they're not giving you the peace and the joy and, and, and the fulfillment, the purpose of living that you long for and so forth. And you're driving along in life, and then you encounter Jesus. He's on the side of the road. He's got his thumb out. There he is. He's, he wants to invade your life. He wants to be a part of your life. And, and you're driving along, and you think, eh, religion, maybe I should try that. You know, it seems to work for some people. Maybe that's what's missing in my life. So you slow down the car and you pop open the passenger side, but something weird happens. 
Jesus comes around to the driver's side. Wouldn't that be weird if you were picking, picking up a hitchhiker? You'd think, whoa, okay, I was going to give you a ride, but I'm not sure I want you driving the car. Have you ever thought about that? But that's what it means to pick up Jesus. Ladies, you know how you buy a main garment and then you accessorize? I've just been through two weddings, so I know what that's all about. <laughs> Accessorizing is very important. It's not that those things are unimportant, but it's not the main attraction. Can I say something very bluntly this morning? Jesus is not interested in being accessory in your life. That's an insult. That is an insult. He is God Almighty. And although it may seem a little bit strange and, and actually feel a bit scary and unnerving, I remember even as a kid growing up in a Christian home, do I really want to give my life to Jesus? What if he makes me be a missionary in Africa? I don't want to go to Africa. There are snakes there. Do some of you get anxious when you think about giving control of your life to Jesus? Where are you at with Jesus this morning? Are you fully embracing him? Are you getting out of the driver's seat and say, yeah, you're right. I'll, I'll slide over to the passenger seat. You take over. It's the only way that my life should be run. You should be in charge. Jesus makes a call to radical discipleship later on in the book of Matthew when he grows up and, and has his ministry. Matthew 10, 37, 38 says this, Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. That's a harsh statement, isn't it? I love my mom and dad. They were great, fantastic. They've, they've passed on now. But Jesus is saying, even your most precious relationship on earth, maybe it isn't a mother and father for you, it's something else has to pale in comparison in your loyalty and allegiance to me. I must be first. That's the only way I can be really a part of your life. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow, parents, that's a heavy, isn't it? Because sometimes our children make bad choices. They start drifting and then and, and it, it creates a bit of a divide. Are we going to embrace them? Or are we going to t that doesn't mean we continue to love them even as they're on their prodigal journey, but are we going to hold fast and say, Johnny, Susie, my love for Jesus is first. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray that you come back to the Lord Jesus, but I love you even more than I love. I love Jesus even more than I love you, and I will not abandon Christ. That's what he's talking about here. Anyone loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Where are you at with Jesus? Fearful, indifferent, hostile? Will you let him be king? The king has come. Let's read the next section. This is the Bethlehem section. After they had heard the king, so this is talking about the wise men, picking up with verse 9 here, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw and the child with his mother, Mary. So there you see, uh, there's maybe a year or more after, Mary and Joseph are no longer in the stable. They're in a house now. Uh, they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So let me contrast uh, the anxiety, the animosity, the apathy in Jerusalem with the adoration of the Magi. And, and that would be my prayer for all of us this morning, that we would truly adore Jesus, 
this morning and every day of our lives. Uh, there's three ways that this adoration is described. First of all, there's joy, there's wonder. They are amazed. They stand in wonder. I love that song, Noel, Noel. Come and see what God has done. Does it still amaze you? Do you still stand in wonder? It says they were overjoyed in verse the Greek, they can pile on. They're allowed to do this in Greek language. Joy, joy, mega, mega. They rejoiced a great joy exceedingly. That's the way you would, it's just, they're piling on the, uh, the adjectives here. Um, Jesus brings joy. Joy is a byproduct of a relationship with Jesus. Uh, you see it throughout the story here. As soon as he... Uh, in Luke 144, Elizabeth, remember, Mary comes. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Luke 210, the angels but, uh, and the shepherds, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Acts 1634, I'm going now to a conversion experience. This is the Philippian jailer. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. Joy comes with Jesus. Psalm 1611, the psalmist says it this way, You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence. In your presence with uh, your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Jesus brings joy. This is a bit counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive because inside of us is our old sin nature, which says Jesus brings, I don't know, anything but joy. I'm not going to become religious. It's going to take all the fun out of my life. How many of you know friends that would say that? That's just... No, that's terrible. I don't, I don't want to give up. They're convinced that Jesus just brings the opposite. Brings slavery or, I don't know, sadness, depression. But Jesus brings joy. This, this was the original uh, temptation, by the way, in the Garden of Eden when the serpent came to, to Eve. Ah, you're missing out, babe. God's holding out on you. Life would really be good if you go eat that apple, if you disobey God. That's where you find happiness. I don't know if I should mention this, but there's this movie coming out which just flaunts this to the nth degree. Poor things. It's R-rated. It's very. Uh, it's not a movie you want to go see. I'm not going to go see it because it's very sexually explicit. But there, uh, it from this, it, it happens in even in our kids' stories, you know, <laughs> where our culture today believes that the secret to happiness is found inside you, throwing off all restraint, and you create your own identity, and that's somehow how you go happiness. But what if inside you isn't that good? What if the real freedom you need is the freedom from sin that binds your own heart? What if real joy is found when God liberates you from your own sin and selfishness and you finally live out his true purpose for you as a human being? What if that's the place of real joy? There is a sense where the Bible is big on freedom. And we're, we're against slavery and all kinds of oppression and so forth. And we should speak out against those things. The, that's absolutely true. But we're also against the oppression of sin and darkness and evil. And it's even worse. And it lives inside of us. I had this little song that I learned when I was a kid. Jesus, others, and you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. Jesus, others, and you, in the life of each girl and each boy. J is for Jesus, for he has first place. O is for others you meet face to face. Y is for you in whatever you do. 
put yourself last and spell joy. Wow, is that anti-cultural or going in the wrong? Put yourself last. No, no. You've got to aggressively express your own identity. Jesus is our model. He was a servant. He humbled himself. Took on flesh for our sake. Put yourself last and spell joy. So joy. Where are you looking for joy this Christmas? I'm convinced that the only place you'll find it is with Jesus. There's no amount of money, no promotions, no new levels of power in your sphere of influence, no whatever will bring you joy, only Jesus. Jesus brings joy. The second thing that their adoration, their love for Jesus is marked by is worship. So thank you for coming to church today. This is God's design. This is God's, uh, in, our, in our family, the way we expressed it when the kids were little is Sunday's church day. Six days God created, and then they rested, and they worshiped. In the Old Testament, it was Saturday. In the New Testament, because of Resurrection Day, they did it on the first day of the week. So we worship. We're designed to do that. It, it goes way back to even before Easter. It goes back to the creation order. As human beings, we need to be worshipers of the living God. Other th otherwise, things go haywire in our life. We start thinking we're God. That's really wacky. So we worship, and we see them worshiping here. Um, it's beautiful expression. Um, the verb uh, bowed down and worshipped him. Worshipped him. Not the mother. Mary's important, but they weren't worshipping the mother. They were worshipping Jesus. They were worshipping that little baby. Well, it was a two-year-old now, little toddler. I still love that scene. It just gives me goosebumps uh, where they're bringing their gifts and they're kneeling and worshiping. The, the word, the Greek word, means to kiss. Kuneo. It, it's probably a reflection of the Old Testament, Psalm 2, where the rulers of the world are warned. All the, all the big shots, the power guys, the, the power brokers, the people with the money and the government rulers and stuff, they're warned. Kiss the son. Kiss the son. Bow down to him. You're not in charge. Bow down to him. Psalm 2, you can read it. It's just a short psalm. It's a great psalm. It's a coronation psalm. It's ultimately Jesus' coronation. And, and they're told to bow down to him. And it was a way in, in Eastern cultures at that time, you would express homage. When you come into the court of the king, you would bow down. And he might hold out his hand, maybe even his foot, but you would kiss. It's an expression of allegiance, of loyalty. It's letting Jesus be in the driver's seat of your car. Worship. Bow down. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So worship is something we do on Sunday, but it's something 24-7. It's something you do at your place of work, at your neighborhood, when you go grocery shopping. You are a worshiper of the living God, and everything you do is for the glory of God. Um, let me throw something out here. We are going to have a baptism service Easter Sunday, I think. We have several people who have expressed interest in baptism. If you've never been baptized, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, or maybe you were baptized as a baby, which is fine, that's good. Um, some traditions do that. But you, you have never been baptized as an adult. You never, maybe your parents made the decision for you or something, and they, they baptized you, and that was good. They wanted to raise you in a Christian home. That's okay, and so forth. But maybe you've never been baptized. You've never publicly said to friends, relatives, and everywhere in a, in a rather dramatic fashion that I pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ. 
That's my first and foremost identity. I have a lot of identities. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I do this particular job, and so forth. But the top card on the top deck, the one that I play first, my first identity is I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Think about that. If you've never done that, maybe you should get baptized. You can uh, just let the call the church off or something if you're interested. We'll have some classes in uh, January and, and uh, February, and we'll explain a little more what baptism means. Last thing here, the way they express their love for Jesus. Oh, this one hurts. They open their treasures. Mm, 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 uh, uh. Do you like holding things, <laughs> precious things? Yes, I hold them tightly. So that's my personality. You know, in a marriage, hopefully you got one of both because that helps balance. Some, if you're both spenders, oh boy, that's trouble. God, God have mercy on you. Some, almost someone's accountant in your family. Uh, but, uh, well, the nice way to say it is I'm the saver and Andrea is the giver. Now, if you're not feeling in such a happy mood with your mate, you might say, you're a miser. Do you hold some of these things too tightly? It says they open their junk, the stuff they didn't want it, the stuff that was worn out that wouldn't fit anymore, the stuff they didn't care about. Ah, give them that. That's nothing. Is that what we do with Jesus? Do you give him your treasures? The things that you treasure the most, do you give that to Jesus? Your treasures? There's a joke. If the wise men had been women, they would have asked directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, and brought practical gifts. (laughs) Some truth to that. But actually, these were practical gifts, and they were very costly, expensive gifts. Obviously, the gold, we understand uh, in any culture, but uh, frankincense and myrrh, we might not understand, but these were valuable, expensive commodities. So just like today, you know, you're trying to figure out where to put money so it's safe and so forth. They didn't have banks so much, so they would buy commodities. People would have commodities. They would buy things that were precious, and that was their savings account. That was their their retirement, their whatever, you know, that was their precious. It's like the, the, the story of Jesus where the woman comes and breaks over the alabaster jar of expensive perfume. She had been saving that all her life. That was her safety net, her security. She breaks it and pours it on Jesus and uses her hair to wipe him. It's a powerful expression of love. She gives him her treasure, her treasure. Uh, in the, you got the video a little bit. Gold, of course, is a symbol of royalty. Incense uh, speaks of deity and his priesthood. And myrrh, of course, is uh, foreshadowing that he was going to die because it was used at burials. Um, but these were very practical. This is what Joseph probably survived on because uh, they, not long, uh, the next day or so, I mean, we'll, you come ne- back next Sunday, we'll talk about it, but they have to flee to Egypt. Herod's angry when the wise men don't come back. You can read the rest of the story, but we'll look at it next Sunday. But they have to run for their lives, and so this was very timely, very important. So it blessed them. But I, I want to talk about the greater blessing was to the wise men themselves. Um, we don't communicate a lot here. We don't put a lot of financial information and stuff in there because at the end of the day, that's, that's not what we're about. But I'll, I'll, uh, I, the trustees met on Wednesday, and I'll just be honest with you. We need a big December, people. <laughs> we need about 135000 which is like double our monthly or almost triple our monthly to make budget. But we haven't spent all our budget, so probably to end up in the black, we probably need about 100000 
That's all I'm saying. Because at the end of the day, I'm convinced that giving, does giving bless others? Did, did these wise men, was this timely for Joseph and Mary? Yes, this poor couple, it was very timely, and it blessed them. But I think the, be, the bigger impact was on the wise men themselves. And if there's anything I've learned in my miserly, savorly personality is the giver is more blessed than the one given to. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's a verse in Acts, quote from Jesus. Um, but we don't put high pressure here. In fact, one of the verses uh, that I've memorized over the years is, what is it, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, I think it is. Each man should give whatever is in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Okay? We're not supposed to be squeezing you guys. That's not, that's not the way the Bible intends giving to be. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. Then it goes on, for God loves a cheerful giver. He wants you to find joy in it. And you will find joy in it. I've discovered that. And by God's grace, I'm not as miserly and savorly as I was yesterday or the day before. The day before, he's teaching Sam that generosity is really a better way to live. It's a great way to live. It's, it blesses you even more than the people you're generous with. Okay. Missing the point. December 17, 1903, Catherine Wright... She's the sister of the Wright brothers. You know, the guys that invented the... Well, at least they think they did. I know there's some people in Europe maybe say some of those guys were ahead. I don't know. But Catherine is Orville and Wilbur's sister. Okay? So uh, she gets... I think she was living in Ohio. They were, of course, on Kitty Hawk out on the Outer Banks there when they were doing the flying thing. So she received a telegram from her brothers, Orville and Wilbur, and it read, We have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home for Christmas. So she, she gets this telegram. She rushes to the local newspaper. She shows them the tele, telegram to the editor. He reads it for a while, and then he sits back and he goes, Oh, how nice to have your brothers home for Christmas. <laughs> He kind of missed the point. God doesn't want us to miss the point this Christmas. Yeah, it's nice to have family around. Uh, Charlie just got back, and the girls are coming this week with their new husbands. We're looking forward to that. It is going to be fun and stuff. But that's not the firm, first and foremost point. Those are just added blessings that God gives in our life. But the number one blessing is the king has come. The king has come. And life will never be the same. Life will never be the same for Sam Gertz because the king has come. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for this little glimpse, I, uh, I, along with I'm sure everybody here, looks forward to uh, someday, um, you know, seeing uh, the whole more detail, the story. Just to, uh, that'll be a fun popcorn night or whatever, and we'll just watch that whole event unfold in all its detail, and and not the Hollywood versions, which tend to get some of the stuff wrong, but to actually see what happened uh, that night when the shepherds came, and then. Uh, some months later when the, when the wise men came. We look forward to seeing that. Um, thank you so much for your love for us. Uh, thank you for sending Jesus uh, to free us, uh, not only uh, from those outside forces of oppression, but the even sin more sinister oppression in our own heart. Thank you, thank you for Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.